Another year, another new Mac. Apple's new M2 Ultra chip found in the equally new Mac Studio and Mac Pro is their latest effort to deliver custom silicon throughout the entire lineup. The form factor here is the same as the M1 Ultra from last year, but the power inside is in a league of its own, and it's one of the best values you can get if you're a creative professional. We're going to look at it today with my usual go-to benchmarks, video rendering, but everyone from graphics professionals to musicians should pay attention because the performance on display is truly impressive. So we recently covered the reveal of the M2 Ultra, but as we've done in the past, we had to put the new Mac Studio to the test. Apple's iterations are somewhat predictable at this point with new architectures debuting on the lower end platforms and eventually coming out in refined, scaled up versions for the power users like us. We saw it with the M1 and now we're at the logical conclusion for the M2. To briefly go over the specs that we mentioned in our last video, the M2 Ultra doesn't hold back. It is literally two M2 Max chips fused together, though it operates as a single all-powerful processor with double the resources at its disposal. A 24-core CPU, up to 76-core GPU, up to 192 gigabytes of unified memory, and as a result of the combined chips, a blistering 800 gigabytes per second memory bandwidth. Those getting into the exploding field of machine learning can also leverage the M2 Ultra's 32-core neural engine. Apple's own benchmarks for tasks such as 3D rendering, interaction, and code compiling show significant gains over even the previous M1 Ultra. Still, I prefer real-world examples, so for today, we're looking at M2 Ultra performance in a few common video applications because it's easy to predictably render out actual edited projects that give a real sense of what the M2 Ultra can do. Starting in Adobe Premiere, we've got a project here with mixed 4K 10-bit camera formats, multiple video tracks, image scaling, color grading, 2D motion graphics and audio mixing effects. You can see that scrubbing through is fast and responsive enough as it is, even with proxies disabled. And with proxies, it's almost comically fast. So let's export it. The actual test here is technically with Adobe Media Encoder. Our first test was with a 10-bit HEVC encode done on the hardware encoder, aiming for 35 megabits. The M1 Ultra Mac Studio finished rendering the project in 6 minutes 50 seconds, which in itself is impressive given it's just under half of the video's 14 minute, 10 second runtime. The M2 Ultra, meanwhile, finished the project in just six minutes, 19 seconds, which is slightly faster and represents a 7.56% speed increase over the M1. ProRes is of course uniquely supported on all Apple Silicon starting with the original M1, but the Ultra series does effectively double the amount of encoding and decoding potential due to the fusing of two CPUs. Regardless, our test here was simple. The M1 Ultra rendered a 4K ProRes 422HQ version of the same project. No surprises here, with a hardware ProRes encoder, the export came out actually a bit faster at 5 minutes 58 seconds. The M2 Ultra followed with similar results compared to its HEVC encoder. It still beat the clock on the M1 Ultra with a render time of just 5 minutes 22 seconds, this time equivalent to a speed up of about 10%. Moving on to DaVinci Resolve, this project is a little different, but offers additional complexities into the mix over our Premiere test. Again, we have mixed 4K formats, color grading, image scaling, some 2D motion graphics, and audio mixing effects, but this time, the timeline also leans heavily on multi-camera nesting, and the project itself runs longer at 24 minutes 9 seconds. Just like before, we're starting with a 10-bit 422-4K HEVC encode at 35 megabits. The results here were shocking, both in terms of the Apple Silicon's performance, but also of Resolve's optimization around the platform. To start, the M1 Ultra finished rendering the project in, get this, 5 minutes, 51 seconds, which was just a fraction of the 24 minute, 9 second runtime. Again, already impressive. But it gets even better with the M2 Ultra. The new chip finished the same project in an even faster 3 minutes, 5 seconds, which is literally only 12.7% of the project's runtime. Running the ProRes test, we followed the same 422HQ spec as before, starting again with the M1 Ultra. This time, the render actually took a bit more time, coming out at 6 minutes 56 seconds. Surprisingly, the M2 Ultra didn't seem to be as affected by the change in codec. It finished the ProRes export in 3 minutes 8 seconds, which is not only dramatically faster than the runtime, but also much faster than the M1 Ultra. So when we reviewed the M1 Ultra, I tested out Handbrake not only for its extensive codec options, but mainly because its software encoders are an excellent stress test for the CPU side. It does have hardware encoding support to be clear, but this time I'm sticking just with the software side. So I set up Handbrake to use the X265 software encoder on the medium preset, again set to 35 megabits. 
Software video encoding in general is far slower than dedicated hardware options, so the results here are best viewed in relationship to the previous generation. This is useful to take the hardware assistance out of the equation and view the CPU improvements alone. The M1 Ultra finished encoding our resulting ProRes file from before to 10-bit HEVC in one hour, 26 minutes, 12 seconds. Yes, it really does take that long. Meanwhile, the M2 Ultra finished the same video in an hour, 19 minutes, 52 seconds, representing a speed up of about 7.35%. Does this number sound familiar to you? If you recall, our Premiere Pro HEVC export from way in the beginning yielded a difference of 7.56% between the two chips. Now, this doesn't mean that the M2 Ultra is only 7 to 8% faster, because remember, that test was using a hardware encoder. It's difficult to determine the split in CPU and GPU resources when actually rendering a video, and how optimized a program is to take advantage of the platform. For what it's worth, Adobe Media Encoder was measured at about 21.2% CPU usage, and core utilization was fairly evenly spread out, but mostly only on the high-performance cores. We couldn't accurately measure GPU usage, but with the Mercury engine on in the encode, it should be leaning on the GPU side for a good portion of the render pipeline. Contrast this with DaVinci Resolve, which only peaked at an average of 9.2% CPU usage for HEVC, and surprisingly, only 3.6% on average for ProRes. And you can see that one is able to use the GPU resources much more effectively than the other. And that's the real takeaway here. The M2 Ultra as a platform collectively provides more resources to the programs that can utilize them. There are four extra CPU cores on the M2 Ultra, and while both Premiere and Handbrake multi-thread out to utilize them, only Handbrake maxes out CPU usage overall with a solid 90% average. The GPU can also be configured with up to 12 more cores than the M1 Ultra, and so the combined resources can add up to the kind of results we see in DaVinci Resolve. Regardless, we're now three years into the age of Apple Silicon, and the software has definitely matured a lot to accommodate it since then. Today, there are fewer programs that rely on Rosetta 2 compatibility, and the performance difference between Apple's final Intel-based hardware is so great now that you really are missing out if you haven't made the switch yet. Now, to be fair, if you have an M1 Ultra Mac Studio already, then there isn't going to be much incentive here for you. But there is one more possible upgrade for you that we didn't look at here, and that is the M2 Ultra Mac Pro Tower. The Mac Pro hasn't seen a proper upgrade in years now, and at last, those who have the absolute biggest need for I.O. and expandability can enjoy the benefits of Apple Silicon in the traditional desktop form factor. Like I said, we're not covering it here really because the Mac Studio honestly packs in the same power into a much smaller footprint, and for its size, still has a very generous amount of connections, display options, and cooling. The Mac Pro's only real benefit here is if you do in fact need PCIe expandability. For users who work with specialized expansion cards, this is the way to go. So while we have constrained our test to video encoding tasks only, the M2 Ultra is absolutely built for just about every graphical production and coding use case. So what do you think of the new M2 Ultra performance and the Mac Studio overall? It's a powerful workhorse option for countless creatives that delivers on just about every front. So let us know in the comments below. I'm Doug with BNH, and I'll see you next time.